Hi, I'm Jess Keating, and this is Animal Logic Second Nature. Most insects have natural enemies, parasites and predators. The larvae of a tiny wasp has destroyed the internal organs of this aphid. Parasitic zombification. This horror of evolution is exhibited by multiple species separated by thousands of years on the evolutionary tree. The larvae of such parasites grow up inside the bodies of their hosts and emerge to pupate and start a new life cycle. From fungi that turns ants suicidal, to chest-bursting wasps, to worms that feast on the insides of crickets, science fiction really takes its cues from nature. The wave of murder is being committed by creatures who feast upon the flesh of their victims. First eyewitness accounts of this grisly development came from people who were understandably frightened and almost incoherent. Parasite-host relationships are in an ongoing battle of evolution. The two are continually adapting to try to find advantage over each other. None are more fascinating than the behavior-altering parasites, the parasites that turn their hosts into husks of their former selves, with all free will removed. Zombies. Zombies. The living dead. Ophiocordyceps are a genus of fungi found primarily in tropical rainforests. Like many fungi, they need to spread their spores through the air to reproduce. But when living in a relatively windless rainforest, this can be difficult. But the Ophiocordyceps have found a solution. A fascinating and horrifying solution. Ants. Ants are mostly a nuisance. New poisons are developed to rid us of insect pests. The cordyceps will release a burst of spores as an ant passes by. If one of these spores lands on the ant, it can penetrate the ant's exoskeleton. The skeleton of an insect is outside its body and is called an exoskeleton. Once inside, the fungus grows rapidly, feasting on the ant's internal organs, and within three and a half weeks, half of the ant's body weight is the fungus. The cordyceps severs the ant's nerves, cutting communication between its brain and muscles, it's now controlled entirely by the cordyceps. Yet despite this internal carnage, the ant still shows no symptoms. When the cordyceps have fully grown, it will guide the ant out of the colony, always when the sun is highest in the sky at noon, and lead it up a leaf that is 25 centimeters off the ground. The cordyceps are always sure to guide the ant to a leaf that is in their temperature sweet spot, between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius, and a humidity of 95%. This is the ideal temperature for the cordyceps to thrive. The leaf will also be close to an ant trail, making it easier for its spores to find a new host. Then, the cordyceps will have the ant bite the underside of the leaf, holding it in a death grip that the ant is unable to open. Now, with the hook in deep, he twists it to make sure the victim will never get away. Now, the cordyceps finishes the job. It devours the ant's brain, and over the next three weeks, it bursts out of the ant's head, forming a tall stalk. When grown, the stalk will begin to release spores along the nearby ant trail, claiming fresh victims. These parasites can devastate ant colonies, but ants have adapted. When they find a fallen ant, they carry its body far away from the colony in case it's been taken over by cordyceps. This is why it's so crucial for the fungus to force their host to look as normal as possible and thus skirt detection. All law enforcement agencies and the military have been organized to search out and destroy the marauding ghouls. This battle between ant and fungus has been happening for at least 48 million years. Scientists have found leaves of that age that have the trademark dumbbell-shaped death bite of the zombie ant. Yet despite their sinister reproductive strategy, cordyceps also find themselves victim to parasites. And parasites that attack harmful insects are also helpful to man. 
These parasites within a parasite are called hyperparasites. The one that the cordyceps are host to remains unknown. But they make it so that only 6.5% of all cordyceps can produce spores. Without these hyperparasites, ants would be in for a world of hurt. Cordyceps do target other species, but ants are the most effective due to their eusocial nature. Some ants find themselves victim to another type of parasite, the lancet liver fluke. These flatworms have a much more complex life cycle than cordyceps and begin their journey in the humblest of places, sheep poo. And what loves eating sheep poo? As it turns out, snails do. The fluke enters the snail, which shortly after releases it in little slime balls, an often favorite treat of some ants. Once eaten by the ant, the fluke will travel up to its cerebral ganglia. There, it releases a chemical that forces the ant to leave the colony at night, climb up a blade of grass, and wait to get eaten by a sheep. If the ant is so unlucky as to not be eaten, the fluke will have it return to the colony and pretend to be normal for another day, until it forces it to go out again. When it's eaten, the fluke will work its way into the sheep's liver, where it will lay its eggs to be excreted by the sheep, starting the whole process again. Other flukes follow similar life cycles, but instead of controlling ants to reproduce in sheep, they control fish to reproduce in birds. They infest the fish and then force it to constantly jump out of the water, making it an appealing snack to a passing gull. Lesson learned, don't trust a meal that looks like it wants to be eaten. Fortunately, the parasites found in water get a whole lot worse than flukes. The larvae of the aptly named kamikaze horsehair worm is born in water, where it is unknowingly gobbled up by other larval insects, like mosquito larvae. The mouth parts are seen to be in constant motion when feeding at the water surface. Suddenly, the skin bursts along the middle of the back, literally oozing out of the pupil envelope. When the infested mosquitoes eventually exit the water, they'll be eaten by crickets. Here, the horsehair worm will grow, sustaining itself by eating the cricket's insides. When it's fully grown and ready to mate, the worm begins to control the cricket's movements, forcing them to jump into the water and kill themselves. Multiple larvae can infest a cricket, leading to dozens of horsehair worms bursting from a single cricket. Once in the water, the horsehair worms will find a mate, reproduce, and restart the cycle. Green crabs fall victim to a similarly grim fate. The horrifically named castrator barnacle will make its way through a crab's joint into its exoskeleton. The barnacle will find its way to the rear of the crab, where their eggs are incubated and emerge from the crab as a sac. From this point on, the barnacle begins to change everything inside the crab's body. If the crab is female, it destroys its reproductive organs, and if it's a male, the barnacle starts to change the shape of the male to resemble a female. These body snatchers force the crabs to care for and lay their eggs as if they were their own. These parasites stay with the crab and use it to reproduce and guard its young until the crab dies. This hornworm, covered with small silk cocoons, is doomed to die. A parasitic wasp laid its eggs within the hornworm's body. Dinocampus coccinelli wasps employ a similar strategy. They hunt ladybugs, and when they find one, they inject their egg into it. After 20 days, the egg emerges from the ladybug and forms a cocoon between the ladybug's legs. Zombified by a virus transmitted by the egg, the ladybug will defend the cocoon at all costs, which drastically increases its survival rate. Fortunately, this story has a happy ending. Well, more so than the others. About 25% of ladybugs recover from the zombification, after the wasp has left the cocoon. But king of zombies, the ladybug killer is not. That title goes to the emerald jewel wasp. These wasps zombify cockroaches, usually about twice their size. When they find one, they sting it two times. The first sting temporarily paralyzes them. This second sting is much more precise. 
they surgically target the part of the cockroach's brain that controls dopamine output, stopping it, and taking away all free will of movement from the cockroach. Cockroach spreads disease as well as ruining food. This is an enemy of man. The wasp will eat one of the roach's antenna and use the other like a leash to walk the cockroach to its grave. Once in the hole, the wasp will lay her egg on the roach and block the entrance on her way out to protect her egg from predators. Three days later, the egg will hatch and the larvae will burrow into the still living, still zombified cockroach. The larvae will feast on the insides of the cockroach before forming a cocoon. There, it will stay in the now dead roach until it finishes its metamorphosis, at which point it will burst out of the cockroach. Delightful. So what should I talk about next? Be sure to let me know in the comments and please subscribe so you get new episodes of Animal Logic Second Nature every other week. Thanks for watching. Millions more insects are hatching out all around us. New hordes of insects to compete with the swelling population of mankind for the necessities of life.